Senator Joe Lieberman has had a lot of titles. He's been a committee member, he's been a lawyer, he's also Saba or Poppy as he's known to his grandchildren. And he's a Jew in the pew and a synagogue member. And he sat down with me to talk about life during the pandemic, what it's been like for him and how much he can't wait to return. Stay tuned for Are You Coming Back? Good morning. <laughs> How are you, Rabbi? It's a pleasure to meet you, Senator. Uh, nice to pleasure. meet you. How's uh, Rabbi Adam Clickfeld, that little kid from our neighborhood in New Haven, doing? He's doing great. He told me a great story yesterday that he remembered that years ago, he couldn't remember if it was the 70s or the 80s, that you gave yeah. away... Uh, little yellow expandable sponges. Wow, with, what a memory. With, with uh, Joe, with maybe vote for Joe or Joe Lieberman on them, and his family had both milchig and fleshig. <laughs> so uh, I rem it was the 70s, yeah. and I was running for state senator, and I had a one of my cousins married a man who was in an unusual business where they manufactured items for companies to advertise. And he said, oh, I have a great uh, gift I'm gonna give you for your campaign. <laughs> it was these, uh, they, came, they came like pieces of paper almost and you put them in the water and it became sponges, but it had my campaign logo. <laughs> anyway. 50 years later in yeah. California, uh, you yeah. were remembered well. <laughs> So, um, uh, dare I ask, how old is Rabbi Clickfield now? Uh, near 50. Isn't that something? Yeah, okay, God bless him. And his parents are okay? Yeah, so far as I know, they're okay. And in yeah. Connecticut, your, your sweet home. I haven't seen them for a long time. We actually live in Riverdale, New York now, because uh, oh. when I retired from the Senate, we moved here because two of our four children are here and five grandchildren. And one of the two others, one is in Atlanta and the other is in Israel. So uh, this was the closest we came here. Anyway, it's yeah. a pleasure to be with you. And uh, is that a real picture behind, that's a real scene behind you? It is not a real scene behind me, but it but it is a, a place to meditate on when I would yeah. rather not be in my four walls. No, it's lovely. Thank <laughs> okay. you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm honored that you said yes to talking about um, spiritual life in this time for you. Yeah, um, it's an interesting I, topic. Yeah, I mean, you've written about it. You've written about it, not just for Jewish people, but for for all human beings, how Shabbat alone can just be kind of a gift to people, right? You wrote that book uh, almost a, a decade ago about it. Sure. And um, I know you think deeply about it. And I wondered if we could start our conversation by having you take me back a year before the pandemic uh, began right. and tell me, take me back to a Shabbat morning. What was Shabbos like? What was Friday night like? What were you doing before this yeah, all sure. started? Yeah, no, I mean, Shabbos uh, really is uh, a, an anchor of my life and really a, a time we always look forward to. I mean, it's funny, I just said to my wife this morning when we were taking our pandemic walk, um, hey, it's Thursday, it's tomorrow's our Shabbat, you know, even though we're not moving around as much for the other six days as we used to, it's still Shabbat is different. So an Arab Shabbat is different, but going back a year, you know, sometimes, I mean, at different times in my life, certainly when I was in the Senate, um, it was, uh, uh, if I was in Connecticut already, well, it was okay, but you still scrambled uh, to make sure you got home on time. But when we were in Washington, let's say we were voting on a uh, Friday morning, it's just a run to the uh, uh, to the airport to get the plane. And a lot of little things you end up doing out of necessity, like uh, we had a wonderful guy who was in the Haven policeman, a dear friend of mine, James Kevin O'Connell who was with me 30 years, died prematurely of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. But um, 
you know, he would, uh, when, when Hadassah would not be able to go up earlier, but come with me on Friday, he knew the whole routine to go to the kosher food store to buy the Shabbat meal that Hadassah had ordered. If I may add a little humor here, <clears throat> one of the first times he did it, I said to him when he picked us up at LaGuardia, Jimmy, did you get the food? Oh, I got it. I said, it was okay. He said, well, yeah, everything was fine. He said, but... Uh, that guy running that store, he should be wearing a mask and, and having a gun in his hand. I said, why? His prices are a holdup. <laughs> They're outrageous. <laughs> I thought, okay. Anyway, but but now I'm retired, but still quite busy. But I've, I've actually tried in the years. It's now in my eighth year since I left the Senate. Actually, maybe the beginning of my ninth. Um, that... Uh, I'm with a law firm in, in New York, and, I, and I'm associated with a lot of different um, nonprofits, profits. And, uh, but I really tried not to work out of the house on Friday. <clears throat> you know, before the pandemic, <clears throat> I was doing um, a lot of virtual stuff. So, anyway, I'm speaking too long, but Hadassah uh, and I really share our love. My wife, Hadassah, and I share our love of Shabbat and she's really, she, she does things because of her own upbringing and values that mean so much to me. I mean, the Shabbos table is always set. Um, you know, it's our custom, our minhag that I buy flowers for the table for her. I'll give you another funny story. Once um, in, when I was a Senator, there was a reporter for one of the Capitol Hill uh, newspapers, stopped me at the subway there and said, I, I just wanted to ask you, I'm doing a study. It was around Valentine's Day. How often do you give your wife flowers? I said, once a week. What? So I said, yeah, every Friday I give her cut flowers. So in the article, he writes that I'm clearly the most romantic member of the U.S. Senate. <laughs> but it was really Shabbat. Anyway, we have a meal. Now we're alone. Before the pandemic, <clears throat> of course, we would either have our kids or grandkids in the neighborhood, two of whom live uh, within walking distance, or we would go to their houses. And it's been a real deprivation since then. And then we joined a wonderful show here called the Riverdale Jewish Center. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, whatever the reason, I'm not a daily minion attender, but I love to go to show on Friday night and Saturday. We have a wonderful cousin, <clears throat> Shem Kramer, uh, and so that's what I would do. And uh, we we go to show. We had a. <laughs> I realize I'll tell you a later that um, I when I arrived at uh, the Riverdale Jewish Center during the Haftorah, one of the people who I'd known a little before came over to me and he said, um, "I have to take you out to something." I said, "Well, the Haftorah is up." No, no, don't worry, come with me. And uh, went into the kitchen, and there was a Kiddush club, which the rabbi uh, apparently winked at. Uh, there were about 15 or 20 people. After a while, my wife said, where are you going? And I said, there's a kiddish club. So can I come? I said, you know, there's no women there, but why not? They're, they're not going to keep you out. So then she began to come with me and other, other women. Anyway. <laughs> I think that's a, that might be the only reason why we keep Haftorah. Just so that there's a long <laughs> enough break when nobody bothers and you yeah, can walk out for yeah, kiddish club. Look, so we loved it and the show was <laughs> nap and all the rest. So. I mean, that's a quick trip and a few stories to what Shabbat yeah. was uh, before. Yeah. Well, we were just saying in our community last night as we were preparing for the Tanit today and the Chag tonight, you know, mm -hmm. with the whole yeah. the whole day here, we're, we're using it kind of to mark this year Jewishly. The Jews like to mark time right. um, with holidays. Right. So it, this Purim tonight already is marking almost a year. Uh, can, yes. Do you remember the first thing, kind of spiritually, Jewishly, or otherwise, that that sticks out to you as the first thing that seems, well, this is not going to be normal for a while in your world? Yeah. So on March 12th, which was a Thursday of last year, I had uh, a speaking engagement, a meeting I was speaking to in Washington. So I flew down. And when I came back, uh, two of my children, both daughters, we have four kids, two sons, two daughters. The daughters were outraged mm. that I'd gotten on the plane. 
and I hadn't taken it seriously enough yet. And they said, you got to stop this. So beginning the next day, Friday the 13th, uh, I, start, I basically stopped. I went to two kind of urgent meetings during the year in Washington, but um, I'm trying to remember that first Shabbat, which was on Friday night, March 13th. My guess is, I don't know, we might have gone. What happened, the pattern that began is as follows. Um, and it changed Shabbat, really. Um, so um, uh, I began with Hadassah to go on uh, Friday night. Uh, she usually, often she doesn't go on Friday night, Friday night, but Saturday. And they uh, were social distance in the show. Uh, so in the main sanctuary, which probably seats about 600 or 60 or 70, there were uh, a lot of services. And after a little bit, um, Hadassah uh, didn't want to be inside. She just felt it was risky. And the shul actually started an outdoor minion, um, which we went to up on the roof. We say we're not fiddlers on the roof, we're daveners on the roof. And uh, it was okay during March, April, May, during the summer, but then as it got into the winter, we still go, but it's, it's kind of, it can be brutal. So during, the, as we got into the winter, we started to stay home. And um, it, was, it was interesting because it changed the whole routine of Shabbat. I mean, I didn't, I, I, I haven't gone on Friday except once when our cousin had been away and was back from Israel. I got special permission from my wife to go socially distanced to Friday night to hear him. He does a wonderful uh, Kabbalah Shabbat and Mark. So, um, but uh, uh, sometimes we would stay home when the weather was bad. And uh, it was actually quite special or a different kind of way We'd sort of get up slowly and not having to get there right on time. Uh, you know, the coffee baker was preset or the hot water. And uh, we'd sit and read the newspaper, which is delivered to our door. And um, then I'd dive in and we would learn, Hadass and I learned together. It was actually, we hadn't done that in quite a while. And it was quite meaningful uh, to us. And then uh, usually we would take a walk. Now, here's a little. But this is an adaptation to the pandemic. One late Shabbat morning, it's probably early in the summer, maybe late spring, we were walking through the park, which is a, a kind of across the street and a little bit up from where we are. And it was about 11.30 uh, on Shabbat morning, maybe quarter to 12. And we saw two couples who are friends of ours sitting at a table there. They had been on a walk. So we sat down with them and we had a lovely talk wished him a Shabbat Shalom. And then the following Friday, one of the men, Harry Fader, called me up and said, hey, if you're walking through the uh, Seton Park tomorrow around the same time, uh, the Schusters and we will be there. And uh, I'm bringing uh, herring and chopped liver. And uh, I said, Harry, I'm going to bring a bottle of scotch. So there we were, and we, we started the Kiddush, and we now have, people begin to hear about it, we now have 15 or 20 that meet their weather allowing every uh, Shabbat later morning, and I, all this says is, it's, it's, not, it, it's not really the Kiddush, it is the Kiddush, but it is the social interaction, and it, I, I always knew, but this really got me in touch with the fact that I love the, the, the service. I love the davening. I love with a good chazan, but I love it even not because I sing, you know, to my, with, uh, with myself. I hear myself. Uh, but I also obviously love the interaction, the talking to friends, sometimes too much during the davening. And then the kiddush is a time for that. So this, obviously, I wasn't the only one because people are very uh, devoted to coming to this kiddush, we call it the kiddush in the park, and um, so that's how we've adapted. But I must say, I really look forward to uh, going back to the regular shabbos. And, and incidentally, the other thing that's happened, particularly in the uh, minion on the roof, and particularly as it's become colder, the the davening, which would normally take. Uh, we'd go to a minion that started at 9, and it would probably be over by 
this minion on the roof never takes more than an hour. <laughs> and they're davening quickly. There's no sermon. I missed the sermons, believe it or not. I didn't want to tell you that, Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> I told my rabbi, I said, I have a shocking uh, admission to make to you, Rabbi. I miss your sermons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's those are changes before and after. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you found some amazing adaptations and a way to kind of be in community on, on Shabbat. Yeah. It sounds like you found yeah. a way to keep that community feeling alive. What do you think is the biggest loss uh, during this time, spiritually well, or communally? Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, it's, it is an interesting question. Um, about You could find spirituality, for instance, on the Shabbos in, in which... Hadass and I stayed home because of the weather, just because we didn't feel like yeah. going. It, we, it, it was very important. We created Shabbat in a different way at home. We learned together. It was very important. And we don't normally do that because we're at show. We're at separate sections. We're, uh, we, we, we listen to the rabbi give his uh, uh, this, uh, analysis or, of, of the Parsha or whatever. Uh, but uh, I miss being in shul. I miss the... Um, I miss the, the community davening. I really do. Mm. And um, when I'm here, I, I sing. That's the sings too, but it's not the same. Uh, mm. And I, obviously, I miss the social uh, interaction. There's a balance to be had. I'll never forget the first uh, uh, Shabbat I came uh, when we were in Riverdale. I went to the uh, show, and I sat next to a, a friend, somebody we've known for a long time. And uh, he's, a, he's a kibitzer and a talker. And at the end of the service, I said, Jack, it's been great sitting next to you, but I realized I got to make a decision. I'm either going to come to show to talk to you or I'm going to come to show to Dobbin. <laughs> so I moved. I actually moved. I said, I love you, but I'm going to Dobbin next week over there. Oh and, my but then I, I moved back about a year later because I felt odd being separated from him and other friends around there. And we've come to a compromise. We talk a little bit, but not too much, <laughs> leaving room for davening. Anyway, you know, the Rebbeim, I mean, all the halakha that says that if you can daven with a minion, it's important to do it, uh, as opposed to davening at home alone. There, it, it, There's a reason for it. The reason, I'm sure, is to create a minion for people say Kaddish, et cetera, et cetera, there are practical reasons. But it is more satisfying for me, and I think for yeah. most people, to be in a community. Yeah. Do you think there are people in the community, friendships uh, and um, tethers to, to human beings who you knew in that community that, that have just fallen by the wayside during this time? Are there people you haven't seen in a year or conversations you haven't had in a year because of this? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was kind of interesting, if I may be personal. Yesterday happened to have been my birthday. And uh, Happy I got, birthday. thank you. I got probably four or five uh, birthday good wishes emails that were, were comp almost exactly the same word. Um, I'm missing you mm. at Kiddush. It said, happy birthday. I miss seeing you at Kiddush. And I wrote back, I miss you uh, and the Kiddush in that order, really. Uh, so there's a little, there is clearly some of that. Now, some people you're a little extra close to. There's still a few kosher restaurants open in Riverdale outside. So, you know, some of them we've kept in touch with uh, that way. But there's no question that uh, what it reminds me is that some of my um, most significant personal relationships, apart from all the sort of stuff like being a senator, being a former senator, being a lawyer, being a chairman of this group or that group, where I interact with people, that the people, it sounds like the people in my neighborhood, it sounds like Sesame Street or Mr. Rogers, the people in my neighborhood who I know primarily through um, Show davening are a uh, very close and special friend. So I've missed them, no question. And part of why I look forward to getting yeah. back to uh, to to the synagogue soon. 
Yeah, I remember that feeling uh, too. I lived in Washington Heights for a few years oh, and uh, we were living on 187th and we would walk the stairs up to Fort Tryon Jewish Center, which was then being uh, revived by a lot of Hadarniks, right. which I know you know well as right. an institution. I do. Uh, yeah, back in my my seminary days, and I remember we would walk up the stairs, and I would see, you know, I didn't have a date to meet people in the park, but I would see those same people walking up, and I always wondered if they wondered which shul I was going to, because most of them were going to <laughs> Mount Sinai, and they probably wondered uh -huh. which shul is up there. Uh, but there is something about the people in your neighborhood, or even the people you pass on the street when you go to get groceries, and you sort of wonder where are those characters, where do they go when we don't pass them on the street. No, it's yeah. true. Now, some of them are still there on the street, yeah. but uh, a lot of them we don't see. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Do you imagine that, you know, I'm thinking back to that one hour davening that you're mentioning on the rooftop uh, and trying to picture people going back to the two and a half hour davening, some of which will be enticing, but some will be a little, right. you know, a push. How do you think this is going to change the shape, not just of the yeah. Riverdale Jewish Center, but anywhere back at Everywhere. Kesher or anywhere? Yeah. It's a really interesting question. I, it's hard to believe that it won't change some things, but uh, there's a lot of history and tradition behind that longer service. So, you know, I used to say, not so much on Shabbat, but like on the Yom HaMeroyim, long services, I'd say, you know, this, with all respect, this moxer needs a good editing. Really, I mean, it's and um, for instance, you know, in the, in the hour service on the roof at RJC, uh, the davening starts at Nishmat. So, mm -hmm. okay, you, 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 so right away you're gained a whole bunch of time, but it's also halakhically okay. They expect us to be get daven at home, I suppose, and I do. But um, I, I don't know, every congregation is going to have to work that out. I think there's going to be a push for a certain uh, um, shortening of the service uh, since, yeah, um, I think even as I recall, because it's been months, in the indoor socially distanced minion, it's been somewhat attenuated uh, in part because they're doing um, a more, more, more minyanum in that on Shabbat morning and evening in that sanctuary because, because of the social distancing. So, it, I mean, ultimately, the rabbis are going to have to decide that, or the congregations will really, really push. I hope I hope there's a balance struck. I mean, we don't want to, I, I don't want to daven for only an hour every Shabbat morning, right. but I don't want to daven for two and a half or three hours, either, <laughs> if it's possible to avoid that. Yeah, well, maybe this will leave some sort of a thumbprint, but it sounds like there are some there are some very specific things that feel missing, you know, whether or not you do Eladome, whether or not you do a full Pasuke de Zimra, that's one conversation. But like you said, you you miss learning from certain voices, from your teacher, from your rabbi. I that, do. That'll make a return. Yeah, that will, uh, that must return because that's part of, I think, why we come to Shul. I mean, I'm a, I'm a student of uh, Judaism, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not, totally learned it maybe nobody ever is but I, I need to hear the rabbi's analysis I need to hear the uh, commentary and um, so I miss that yeah there, there's a lot that that I I miss too um, what uh, what about family during this time and reconnecting in Jewish ways are you thinking about Pesach coming I Purim, as soon as it's over, yeah. <laughs> is going to lead yeah. to Pesach thoughts. What is it like Jewishly uh, with family these days? No, it's it's difficult. Um, so the kids have been actually almost more protective. The kids in Riverdale, the, a daughter and son and their spouses and, and children, they've been actually in some ways more protective of us than we would be of ourselves. They don't want to feel that they gave us the virus. So they're so far. They've only wanted to um, meet outside. It's been interesting. So we actually have not been together for like a Friday night Shabbat. One, one our daughter uh, has a back. She's the only one who has a backyard of the three of us, and um, 
when the winter started, uh, she and her husband bought a pot, like a little a, a, a see-through tent. And we used it a few times um, with oh, sides open. So it had the, uh, you know, air going through. Um, but we, we miss them. Um, and so we yeah. tend to see them more um, on, uh, well, like Sundays, we, we see them outside, we take walks. Some, one of the families is very sensitive and doesn't even want to go to the outdoor uh, part of the kosher restaurant here. The other one does, so we see them there. But we, you know, and then we, we, um, we Zoom a fair amount uh, with our kids, even here. Now, uh, our youngest child, daughter, and her husband are in Israel. They made Aliyah in 2018 with five little boys. And, you know, we, we really miss them. And uh, um, we're on uh, WhatsApp video at least once a day, at least once a day. <laughs> and so, and no, so we know the costumes that each of the boys is going to wear and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're very, you asked about Pesach. We're very, we have reservations to go to Israel. Uh, for Pesach, mm -hmm. uh, to stay with the kids, but we don't know yet whether we're going to be able to go. So we're waiting. If mm -hmm. not, we'll have to make it here. I was, people say, when are you next going to Israel? I said, as soon as I can, as soon as there's an announcement from the Israeli government, I suppose our government, there's a way to go in without not feeling you're going to be quarantined forever there. Um, then we'll go. We'll make reservations and go. So that's normally... We started a tradition about 10 years ago where um, Poppy or Saba or whoever, whatever they call me, they call me different things, uh, <laughs> uh, hosts uh, the whole family at uh, Pesach. And we've either done it here at hotels or in Israel. And uh, that's been wonderful, really. So we missed that and we hope next year we can do it again, probably in Israel. Listening to you talk about your your personal life, which is a real treat, it makes me wonder how fascinating it is that you've wound up in this stage in your life during this pandemic, which is true for all of us. It's a little tautological, but it's true for all of us that we are who we are during this pandemic. But it's fascinating right. that you are mostly a Jew, a Yid, a guy, a grandpa, a poppy, a Saba, and a lawyer, a professional, but mostly an ex, all of those things. Do you ever wonder or wish or feel grateful that you're in this stage in your life while this is happening and not active senator or a candidate yeah. for a role? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it's, I should have thought about it, but I haven't. <laughs> but it, it would be much more frustrating and it'd be a, a, if I was still active, and there would be a, 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 a danger that I would take risks, um, you know, to mm -hmm. go back and forth to Washington to uh, sort of fulfill my responsibilities as a senator. I mean, I'm quite, what's been fascinating to me, th this would have been an extremely difficult year without the uh, internet, without Zoom, without the capacity to virtually yes. interact. I mean, I'm, I, I practice law half time. Uh, I teach a course at Yeshiva University. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, on uh, two corporate boards and I'm on about five or six different uh, nonprofit boards, two of which take a lot of time, but I love them. One is focused on a US policy toward Iran and the other um, is uh, called No Labels, and uh, it's um, it works to try to bring back bipartisanship to Washington. But I can do all of that uh, on the uh, on Zoom on the internet, and so uh, my days are actually quite busy. But right off from this desk, uh, including not only wonderful interviews about um, really uh, important subjects like this with you. But I do, I do TV stuff from here. You know, that's what they're yeah. accustomed to. So uh, it's a mm. new world. But I can't, I can't wait world. to get out again. I can't wait to get out. <laughs> I feel it. I feel your, your spirit towards that. Yeah. And, and I want to respect the minutes that you've, you've spent with me. I, I wonder if I can ask you one last question. Just if there's, sure. if there's anything that you've been inspired during this time, uh, any, 
any project, any um, anything that maybe was on the back shelf for you in your back pocket that you think coming out of this time will now come to the front burner for you in life? Yeah, well, I mean, in a generic way, I'm inspired by the um, by the people who are on the front lines and and treating people or protecting people from the pandemic. I'm really inspired by what um, what the the pharmaceutical industry and the science community proved mm. that it could do in a crisis to produce these miraculous vaccines. But I will tell you, sort of my nature. Um, I had been thinking for um, quite a while about writing a book, which is not an autobiography, but a series of um, recollections of my career that makes the argument for bipartisan centrist government, why, why from the beginning of the American experience and really really going back to the Torah at the end of the philosophers, great Greek, et cetera, that um, the middle ground and trying to accommodate differences of opinion, which is very much part of Talmudic dialogue is a critical uh, to our democracy and we've lost it. So, when after a little bit into the pandemic, I said, you know, this is my time to write that book. I, I'm here. I have some extra time. So I did it. <laughs> and it's going to be published in the fall. It's called The Centrist Solution. And uh, so that's something where I just said, mm -hmm. okay. Incidentally, I, I wrote the Shabbat book in a funny way. Also, I'd thought about it for a long time. I wrote it probably during 2011 or two. Yeah. Yeah, because I had announced that I wasn't going to run again in 2012. Mm -hmm. So now I was freed from this awful burden of spending hours and hours and hours, days and days around the country raising money for the campaign. And I thought this now I'm going to I got the chance to write the Shabbat book. And I'm, I really, you know, I'm accustomed, as you are, I'm sure, Rabbi, to reading uh, forum in which the author thanks Hashem for enabling him or her to write the book. And it always struck me like, wow, that's a, almost an overreach. And yet I feel grateful that I had the opportunity to write that book. I think mm. in, in the end of my life, I will feel it's one of the most important things I did. So, And oddly enough, mm. it was my seventh or eighth book. And it's by far the best seller. <laughs> Shabbat, who would have guessed? It's, 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 uh, it's got staying power, that Sabbath. Mm -hmm. uh, it does. Yeah. Well, hey, I love you. I I love that story. Um, you know, I want to I want to close on this thought with you to thank you for all of the candid and personal anecdotes, these stories that you shared. The one about the flowers is really sticking with me and the thing that I think is such a great lesson about that story is that I think that many of us who have lived an observant Jewish life, as you describe yourself, you know, an observant Jew, which I think is such a great phrase. Rabbi Ken Cohen back at American University Hillel years ago introduced me to that phrase too, and I've loved it ever yeah. since. Um, and I think that one of the things that it teaches us is that um, people ask us often living an observant life, how do you make time to have a meal every week with your family? Or how do you make time to be such a romantic as you put it? And what's amazing is that sometimes when we're unexpectedly given the quote unquote gift of time, like during a pandemic, it's a right. choice. It's a choice to make that space and to use it in different ways, like writing this book. So the gift of Jewish rhythms and Jewish times uh, is, is really an outstanding and an extraordinary one. Uh, and it, it turns us into all of these things, family people and romantic people and people who take the time to go and sneak into a kitchen with their wife and take a, take a nice shot with friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, thank you. That's a beautiful thought. Really. Call, call it I wish you the you best. Great to have this conversation. Oh, it's such a treat. Thank you for, for, uh, for taking that yes from the Connecticut connection and, uh, and <laughs> hop in line for one it. more Zoom call. Oh, I will, I will thank, send this Dashem. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and uh, since it's Thursday, Shabbat Shalom to you. Shabbat Shalom and Hag Sameach. Hag Sameach. Be well.